Hey there, welcome to First Look. I'm back in Frick Park. I have headphones in today because it is just, it's too windy, it's too windy. I also realized I've hit a new phase of life. And this is for all of you who are chronicling me being a coffee snob. First of all, I've gotten some wonderful gifts of coffee lately. And I thank you personally for the people who have given them, given them to me. You know who you are. They've been great. Uh, but all that is to say, <laughs> I have now gotten to a place in my consumption where Starbucks, it just won't cut it. it. It's not even the price. I mean, it's the price, but it's, these, the, these like small batch, you know, local roastery, whatever's, I'm ruined. I'm absolutely ruined. I can't drink it anymore. I mean, I can, cause you know, I'll drink anything. <laughs> but like, I've gotten to a place now where I, it's like, it's, it's just not as good. And then you think, well, if I'm gonna pay X for coffee, uh, that I'm going to get something that's worth it. And now I feel like I've gotten to a place where I, you know, you go to Starbucks, I just finished one. And now you think I can't, I'm done. I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm past, I'm past it. I've graduated or I've maybe not even graduated. Maybe I'm just, I'm sinking down into the well of coffee so deeply that, um, that I just, I can't do it anymore. So, um, so the snobbery is about to take on a whole other level, I feel like. Uh, right, so I'll try not to be too pretentious about it. It is what it is. This is what it is to age, I think, right? This is like part of it. So. <laughs> All right. Onward and upward. This, uh, this is a unique little week, but I should say, I should say something about the week we just had, because you've had, you may have had at Northmont your favorite two weeks because I haven't really preached that much in the last couple of weeks. So it's like, you've had just all this time to breathe. It's been like your Jubilee, you know, some time to, <laughs> so your time to kind of like, get a little bit of uh, perspective now we had a wonderful uh we had a, a wonderful homecoming of sorts for lisa torty buckingham who did a, a, a just a fantastic job and you can see it didn't take me five minutes to realize why people talk about her uh like someone who just left i mean like it just like, their memories are fresh People came just to see her who like, you know, who, you know, live in different parts of the city and aren't able to come to Northmont all the time. Uh, but they came and supported her and I uh, just wanted to catch up and everything. And, uh, they did a great job and the uh, PW folks all did a great job. It was, it was just a great Sunday. Um, so now, we're at a unique Sunday because it's not unique in the sense that it, it's doing anything. There's, it's not like a special Sunday, but it's the one before Thanksgiving. And I always find that one fascinating because Thanksgiving is one of those holidays, of course, that we all celebrate, but we do very little recognition of in the church, which is hilarious because it's called Thanksgiving. So, uh, I, you know, I was kind of looking at the lectionary for this week and thinking about what I wanted to do. And as you would imagine, if you're a person who's done this for, uh, 12 or 13 years 
you know, you try to find little spots where you can do something new or you can do something you haven't done in a while. And occasionally, when everything kind of lines up the way that it needs to, hold on, maybe you can see this view for a second. Maybe not. That's uh, Homestead. Yeah, anyway. Um, what I like to do whenever I can is get us into a book that we don't normally get into, which is always a lot of fun for me because then it's like, it's like you get to show people something that they just don't know. Uh, and so this week is like that. And so I'll try to fit it into the context that we find ourselves in. Um, but we're going to be looking at Zephaniah. And I think I titled it, some, the, the title of the sermon is something like, which one's Zephaniah? Because I know, I know you haven't read it. And I, <laughs> I've read it, but I mean, it's been a while. Uh, but it actually has, um, the context of it is, is fascinating. And it's actually a, a, a little niche of scripture um, that happens to be important to me for a reason that you wouldn't guess. So, um, a couple of years ago, I just looked it up just to make sure that I was right. A couple of years ago, I did uh, a series called um, One Book, One Story, and I've referenced it a couple of times. Uh, it's sort of a way of like doing a quick overview of scripture like here's the book here's basically what it's about here's the you know the context and here's what you need to be looking for and then here's just one story from it and Zephaniah you know doesn't take a whole lot because it's a pretty short book um, but it has a lot of themes in it that I think are important especially when um, especially in times of trouble. It's one of those in times of trouble kind of kind of books, as a lot of minor prophets are, especially. And so, just to make sure that I was right, or that I remembered correctly, I looked at the first um, two or three minutes of that, of that uh, one book, one story I did. And, um, and it was... Um, it kind of gives you the, an idea of, of what to look for. And so whenever I post this, uh, look for that, um, look for that link to my one book, one story. Uh, you don't have to watch all of it, but if you watch the first few minutes of it, it might give you at least like a basic idea, um, which I'll kind of give you a short, short view of here, uh, here today. So, um, we know that, that the minor prophets, all the prophets, um, you can kind of categorize them in a couple of different ways. Um, some of them were, um, their ministry was to the north, so the northern kingdom, so a little bit earlier. Um, some of them were in the south, so Judah, so either Israel or Judah. And um, most of them we're looking at the exile, either the, uh, the northern exile that happens um, with uh, Assyria in 720, or the Babylonian exile in the south, which happens in 586. And so um, they're either in the north or the south. So that's one thing to kind of be aware of. The other piece of it is sometimes those um, those prophets are um, well established. You know, they're of the kingly order. You know, there's someone who um, who is employed by the court, and sometimes they're kind of rogue agents who come in from nowhere and who you know give the people a message from a direction, from a, from someone they don't expect. 
Uh, so it kind of depends on who it is and, you know, what's happening in the time and all that kind of stuff. So let me give you the basic idea of who Zephaniah is and the world in which he was prophesying. First, Southern Kingdom. So that puts us around anywhere between like 650 and, you know, 580 in that kind of time frame, more or less. And he is of um, what the one book, one story will tell you is that he's of a, um, a royal caste. Uh, so he's a descendant of Hezekiah, who was a king in the south. And he's prophesying at a time of um, King Josiah. And here is where the, the little personal story of mine that you wouldn't be able to guess kind of comes into play. So Josiah, um, the king who is the king at the time of Zephaniah, is um, became king at a very young age. He had to be... Uh, things were crumbling. He had to be strong from the beginning. Um, far too young. And um, as it turns out, that is my son Liam's middle name. And the reason he was given that middle name is because... Uh, because he was premature and he had to be strong from a young age. And Josiah, the name Josiah means uh, Jehovah heals, God heals. And so there's that element to it too, you know, born two months premature. Uh, so that's why his middle name is Josiah, Liam Josiah. Um, so King Josiah uh, was a king who tried to get it right before everything crumbled. So basically what happened was um, Judah was way off base. Nothing was going right. They weren't doing anything the way they were supposed to be doing it. And he spends his, his uh, reign trying to get them back on track. Um, trying to trying to like tighten everything up, trying to like get the temple back in order, try to get things um, moving in the right faithful direction. Um, it hadn't been happening. And um, so he works on making it happen. So, um, I mean, what ha ultimately happens is Jerusalem still falls, but Josiah is... Um, is faithful. He's a, a faithful person in the story, and um, and so that's that's the the context in which Zephaniah is is um, is prophesying because um, he's saying, "Look, this is a, kind of too little, too late." Is more more or less uh, what is what's being said. So that's the that's the setting. So let me give you, as soon as I find the passage, let me give you where we're at. And I found myself on a trail I've never been on, I don't think. I've been on a piece of it, but not this piece. And it's kind of interesting because it's like, it's like Vermont here, the season of the sticks. Um, hold on a second. All right, here's the passage. Hold on, I gotta lean against the tree here to get myself together. All right, here we go. This is Zephaniah chapter one. I think it's verse seven and then 12 to 18. That's the passage for this, for this week. All right, here we go. Be silent before the Lord. For the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and he has consecrated his guests. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he 
do harm. Their wealth shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hasting, fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter and the warrior cries aloud there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring such distress upon people that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them the day of the Lord's from the day of the Lord's wrath. In the night of his passion the whole earth shall be consumed for a full a terrible end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. So warm and fuzzy. That's what I went with. Thanksgiving, right? <laughs> a time of warm and fuzzy. I don't want to go this way. I'm going to go this way. So why did I choose that passage? And why did I choose it uh, right before Thanksgiving? This is not some sort of uh, finger po pointing towards uh, a, what disastrous holidays are. It's not one of those like, hey, your crazy uncle's gonna come and it's gonna feel like the end of the world. And that's not, that wasn't what I was doing. It's, uh, it's a critique. And prophets, if you remember from the whole series I did during the summer about prophecy and poetry, uh, they are, they speak in hyperbole they speak with um, this kind of power and authority and um, with large, ar you know, arching, um, grandiose kind of themes because they're trying to make a point. And Zephaniah is trying to make a point about who the people are, who they've been, and what God's going to do. And if I were them, I wouldn't be terribly happy about it, especially if I had just built a house or planted a vineyard. Um, because it, the story makes me think about Thanksgiving from this particular angle. I think uh, I've been thinking often or a lot about the nature of blessings, the nature of what we have in our lives, why we have those things in our lives, what we're thankful for. And uh, I gotta get off the road for this biker. And, you know, what I find is that I have to, I have to do a little bit of discerning. Otherwise, there's a chance that I get myself into trouble or that I apply things to, um, to God or my faith or whatever in ways that maybe aren't appropriate. Here's what I mean. The people of Israel, or the people of Judah, excuse me, who were doing well, who had it all together, who were well-established and had good portfolios and 501, or 401ks and whatever, um, would have been considered in society as those who clearly had God's favor. And, um, you know, and we have a, we have terms for things like that now um, and ways of thinking about it as like prosperity gospel. You've probably heard that term prosperity gospel. And there's a lot of people on television who ask for your money who are basically uh, prescribed to prosperity gospel. If you give enough to me, if you give enough, if you do enough, uh, if you have enough, 
then that is evidence that God loves you. You're doing it right because you have so much. And if you're willing to give so much to me, uh, then that's evidence of your faithfulness. And you will prosper. Give enough, God will bless you enough. It's a transaction. And as much as we might look at people who are, um, you know, on preachers on TV who do that kind of thing, we fall for it, though, a lot of the time. I do as much as anybody else. You see someone who has it together. You see someone who seems like they're doing the right things. They're saying the words that you like to hear. And you ascribe them as being successful and faithful. And that those two things are the same. That we have an economy that's based on that. You know, that um, the harder you work, the more you know how to manipulate the system, work the system, stay ahead of the system, the better off you'll be and the more successful you'll be and the more we should laud you for being successful. And so we apply that same brilliance to faith, to a church. And a lot of those same issues and, and thoughts were true at the time. And that's a lot of where Zephaniah and other prophets start to critique society, critique the kingdom, is by saying, you have thought all along that by doing this, by being this person, that that means that you're being faithful. All of you are about to find out that you haven't been. And it's going to be extraordinarily painful. Which means, when I think about what I'm thankful for, that it has to change the way, I, you know, the amount of food or the expense of the food or how fancy everything is or the, the house or the car or the trip I can take or the whatever. You know, we, we always have to consider how we came upon those things. What did we inherit? What did our status in society, you know, allow us to, to do? What breaks did we get because of who we are or who we know or all, any of those things? All the stuff that we talk about often. Um, you know, we, we take those things into consideration. And then, well, that leaves, um, well, am I successful if I have family around me? Well, you might have family around you at Thanksgiving, and that might be a, a wonderful kind of blessing, or you might not. Um, you know, you might be someone who is, who either has a very small family or a very distant family or, uh, you know, things are just busy or strange or whatever. You can't travel or they can't travel or whatever the case may be. And then we apply success to how full our table is of people that we care about, which is an, another trap of success and blessing and um, all of that. And so it's one of those things that um, I think that as we consider the why and the how of blessings, that we start to take serious stock about how those things happen and why they do. And believe me, you know, the people I have around me, the people who I care about, the people who I, I get to see, um, the things that I have, I, I try to be grateful for. But I also recognize that uh, some of those things I come, that I have in my life, um, I didn't earn more than the person who maybe tried to also have them and doesn't have them. I didn't work harder than them. I, don't, I didn't do 
more than them. Um, and, I, and I have to be cognizant of that. What does it mean to have a blessing? What does it mean um, to be faithful? And, you know, the longer I do this, the more that I recognize that the only way you can really count any of that isn't by what you consistently can look at around you and see that you have, but you take stock of what you've given. And not in terms of dollars and cents, but how much by your attempts to share empathy and grace and compassion. If you're gonna be feel blessed with anything, it's either moments of empathy, moments of grace, moments of love and compassion that people shared with you, or the moments, the opportunities that you were given to share those things with other people. That, that's a real gift. That's a real blessing. The moments where I got to see or experience grace, empathy, love, and compassion in my life. Those are the blessings. And the moments where I got to extend that to someone else. The gift of a moment to extend compassion and empathy to someone who didn't have it. If I'm blessed with anything, it's those moments. The things we have, the people in our lives, their ability to be with us, us looking around and, and you know, taking stock of all the stuff we have or our professional successes or whatever, those are all fine. But the real blessings that we have in life are the times that we're able to receive the agape type love that we hear about in scripture and when we were able to extend it to someone else. That's my takeaway from this passage as it applies to Thanksgiving. So that's what I got. I'm gonna try to figure out where on earth I am because as I said, I don't know where I'm at on this trail, but I think I'm gonna find out here soon. But I appreciate you walking with me. I appreciate you thinking through that with me. Uh, we'll be doing this again before Thanksgiving, but I thought uh, since I had a moment of your time that I'd take it. So thanks for being you. Thanks for doing this with me. Uh, look at Zephaniah, see what you think, see what you find. And uh, I'll see you next time for another first look. Take care.